themes and scenes which may not be suitable for very young audiences. Parental guidance is advised. We're working to connect a region of over 600 million bridges between our lands. Hello and welcome to ASEAN in Focus. I'm Alma Angeles. We're coming to you live from Manila in Thailand. Hello, Gila. Hello, Alma. Good afternoon. I'm Gila Pablo bringing you the news in the dynamic ASEAN region. On today's headlines. The Philippine Department of Foreign Affairs said at least 32 Filipinos have been evacuated from Afghanistan on Sunday night. <laughs> The OCTA Research Group on Sunday, August 15, said the number of COVID-19 cases in the country is still increasing, with a reproduction number of 1.46% for the period from August 8 to 14. Thousands of protesters in cars and on bikes massed in Bangkok Central Shopping District, one of several mobile rallies across Thailand, demanding the resignation of Premier Prayut chan -Ocha over the handling of the coronavirus pandemic. Despite challenges brought about by geopolitical realities and the COVID-19 pandemic, Senior officials are positive that EU-ASEAN relations are bound to expand and flourish in the coming years. First, the Philippine Department of Foreign Affairs said at least 32 Filipinos have been evacuated from Afghanistan on Sunday night. The DFA has issued alert level 4 which means evacuation or mandatory repatriation for Afghanistan due to the uncertain security situation in the country. The DFA said in a statement that they are now in Doha, Qatar, while waiting for their flights to the Philippines. Another group of 19 Filipinos are also scheduled to leave Afghanistan immediately. According to Foreign Affairs Assistant Secretary Ed Menyes, less than 130 Filipinos remain in Afghanistan. The Taliban were in control of Afghanistan on Monday after President Ashraf Ghani fled the country and conceded the insurgents, the insurgents had won the 20-year war. The astonishingly quick collapse of the government with militants taking over the presidential palace on Sunday night triggered fears and panic in the capital. Thousands of people were on Monday trying to escape Kabul and the feared hardline brand of Islamic rule of the Taliban with scenes of chaos as crowds gathered at the airport. The government forces collapsed without the support of the U.S. military, which invaded in 2001 after the September 11 attacks and toppled the Taliban for its support of al-Qaeda. The United States ultimately failed to build a democratic government capable of withstanding the Taliban despite spending billions of dollars and providing two decades of military support. President Joe Biden was determined to withdraw all American troops by the end of this month, insisting there was no choice and he would not pass this war on to another president. Thousands of protesters in cars and on bikes mass in Bangkok's central shopping district Sunday, one of several mobile rallies across Thailand demanding Premier Prayut chan cha resign over his handling of the coronavirus pandemic. By nightfall, some protesters clashed with authorities, shooting fireworks and flinging projectiles to defend against riot police who had deployed rubber bullets, tear gas, and water cannon. Sparked by concerns about public gatherings spreading the virus, protesters have in recent weeks turned to organizing massive car convoys at major intersections, thus clogging up Bangkok's already traffic-choked streets. Thousands turned up Sunday afternoon for at least three rallies across the Thai capital, with the largest near Bangkok's gleaming shopping malls empty in recent weeks. 
earlier in the day, more so-called car mobs also rallied in the beach city of Pattaya, as well as in the northern cultural hub of Chiang Mai. Overburned hospitals and a sluggish vaccine rollout, coupled with financial woes from weeks-long restrictions on businesses, have fanned anger at Prayut's administration. In other news, flag carrier Philippine Airlines or PAL has canceled Japan flights supposedly scheduled on Monday due to ash emissions spawned by the Fuku Toku Okan Oba submarine volcano eruption. In an advisory, PAL said the cancellation was due to the ash emissions from the Fukutoa Akan Oba volcano and the canceled flights were PR 428, 427, Manila, Tokyo, Narita, Manila, PR-422-421, PR-412-411 Manila, Osaka, Kansai, Manila, PR-438-437 Manila, Nagoya, Manila. Affected passengers may rebook or refund their tickets. They can also convert the ticket cost to a travel voucher. The Manila International Airport Authority said no other airlines with canceled flight or Japan flights is on its list as of uh, 9 a.m. Monday. The Philippine Embassy in Vietnam will repatriate 271 overseas Filipinos and Ho Chi Minh City has extended its uh, coronavirus restrictions for another month. Joining us live from Vietnam, here's Ralph Wandolf Empai. Hello, Ralph. Ralph, good afternoon. That's right. The Philippine Embassy in Vietnam, in cooperation with the Department of Foreign Affairs, repatriated a total of 271 Filipinos in Vietnam yesterday, August 15. They were brought home through a chartered Cebu Pacific flight. 163 passengers boarded in Ho Chi Minh City, while 108 overseas Filipinos joined from Hanoi. Most of the repatriates were in distress due to economic difficulties brought by the COVID-19 pandemic, while some of them were stranded in Vietnam due to flight cancellations. The Philippine government extended $200 to all repatriates, and to ensure their safe travel to Manila, the Philippine government provided the passengers with free RT-PCR tests. Aside from their repatriation, the Philippine Embassy provided assistance to the distressed Filipinos by helping secure food and shelter for them with the help of Filipino community leader Mr. June Felix of Pinoy, Hanoi. The Philippine Embassy personnel and members of the Filipino community in Hanoi and Ho Chi Minh City also provided contributions for the basic needs of the Filipinos in both cities. In other news, Ho Chi Minh City will extend its social distancing status by another month until September 15 in response to sustained coronavirus threats. The decision to continue the social distancing campaign was made on Sunday as the city of 10 million people completed 30 days of semi-lockdown under Directive 16 and recorded 149,286 COVID cases. It had previously gone a social distancing campaign under Directive 15 for 40 days. Directive 16 requires people to stay home and only go out for basic necessities like buying food or medicines or to work at factories or businesses allowed to operate. Directive 15 requires suspension of social events, bans gatherings of 20 people or more in one place and of 10 people or more outside workplaces, schools and hospitals. The pandemic is still raging in Ho Chi Minh City with the number of daily new infections going up on Saturday and Sunday after decreasing for a short time. The fatality rate in the city remains high at 241 deaths on an average per day. The city continues to require people not to leave their homes from 6 p.m. to 6 a.m. the next day except in the following cases. Vaccination, emergency, forces in charge of pandemic prevention, those authorized by the local authorities, employees of supermarkets, convenience stores, and shops and business establishments must remain closed. On Sunday, Municipal Chairman Nguyen Tan Fong said the city plans to contain the pandemic by September 15 in two phases. In the first phase, from August 15 to 31, the city will try to reduce the COVID-19 death rate, expand infection-free areas, and put the outbreak under control. In the next phase, from September 1 to 15, 
the city will strive to reduce the death rate among critically ill patients by 20 percent and to ensure that the number of daily new hospitalizations do not exceed the number of discharged people. Vietnam confirmed 9,574 new COVID-19 cases in 41 localities on Sunday, raising the infection tally in the ongoing wave to 270,986. Back to you, Alma. Thank you very much for your update, Ralph. Please stay safe. Thank you, Alma. Reporting live from Da Nang, Vietnam, I am Ralph Randolph Empire. We live in interesting times. Malaysia's Prime Minister was expected to quit Monday after just 17 months in office, throwing the country into fresh political turmoil as it battles a serious coronavirus outbreak. Mohidin Yassin's tumultuous period in office looks set to end after allies with real support and a last-ditch bid to cling to power failed. We have more updates from Alfred Balmes. Alfred? Hi, Gila. Good afternoon. Today, the country focus of attention is on Malaysia Prime Minister Tan Sin Mohidin Yassin, who is expected to submit his resignation as a Prime Minister during his scheduled audience with the King, Dayan Di Pertuan Agong at Istana Nigara. And today, as Malaysia awaits the special announcement, the big question remains, who will be the next Prime Minister? The ball will be in Yang Di Pertuang Agong's court to decide who and which MP has the majority to form the government. Muhyiddin is also expected to address the nation today. According to the inform official, Muhyiddin told in a meeting with Perikatan National MPs yesterday, he will tender his resignation to the King at Istana Nigara today unless he could get the majority needed for him to remain as Prime Minister. A Pirikatan leader who requested anonymity said Muhyiddin mentioned it all depends on the King as whoever appoints to replace him upon his resignation. Minister in the Prime Minister Department, Datok Siri Muhammad Rizwan Yusuf said the meeting revolved around the resignation of the Prime Minister, adding the Prime Minister had explored all options and considering the interests of the country and the people. Yusuf also said now it depends on the young deeper Chuan Agong to ensure that the country is led by a leadership that prioritizes the welfare of the Rakyat. Another Bersatu MP said Muhyiddin informed the MPs that he had no choice but to step down but that he did not mind remaining if he managed to get the numbers. The MP who declined to be identified said all Bersatu MPs were in attendance and some pleaded with him to hang on. According to the MP, Muhyiddin told them that the other parties in the Perikasan government were urging him to stay on. Among those present at the meeting were Party Deputy President Datuk Siri Ahmad Faisal Asumo, Communication and Multimedia Minister Datuk Saifuddin Abdullah, Minister in the Prime Minister Department Datuk Siri Mustafa Muhammad, Housing and Local Government Minister Datuk Suraida Kamarudin, Deputy Foreign Minister Datuk Kamarudin Jaffa, Deputy Health Minister Datuk Dr. Noor Asmi Gasari, and Deputy Higher Education Minister Datuk Mansur Othman. This morning, Muhyiddin chaired our special committee cabinet meeting to inform his minister that they too will have to resign along him after his attempt for a bipartisan board of confidence were rejected by the opposition. On August 12, Muhyiddin made an offer of seven institutional and constitutional reform in exchange for a bipartisan board of confidence and parliament due in September. Back to you, Jila. Thank you so much, Alfred, for your updates. Stay safe there. Likewise, live reporting from Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia. This is Alfred Balmes. We live in interesting times. Meanwhile, the Philippine General Hospital, or PGH, for the meantime, will not be accepting patients with non-COVID-19 illnesses. In a statement on Saturday, August 14, PGH said the refusal of non-COVID-19 patients is to enable the hospital to receive more COVID-19 patients, especially with the recent rise of utilization rates of hospitals in the national capital region. The PGH said that it will immediately release an advisory for when it will start accepting non-COVID-19 patients once again. 
the number of COVID-19 patients at the PGH has exceeded its initial bed allocation for those infected with the virus. The state-run hospital had allocated 225 beds for COVID-19 patients. As of August 14, the PGH has 260 patients. Meanwhile, the PGH outpatient department, or OPD, will remain closed from August 16 until the next advisory due to the enhanced community quarantine and, of course, to help reduce the number of COVID-19 cases. However, the Department of Ophthalmology and Visual Sciences and the Cancer Institute will remain open. Staying in the country, the Okta Research Group on Sunday said the number of COVID cases in the country is still increasing with a reproduction number of 1.46% for the period from August 8th to the 14th. Data from the latest Okta monitoring report show that seven provinces are already above 70% in healthcare utilization. Now, these provinces include Cebu, particularly Cebu City, Lapu-Lapu City, and Mandawe City, Cavite, Laguna, Pampanga, Batangas, Misamis Oriental, and Cagayan. The independent research group also said two provinces were at critical risk in average daily attack rate, or ADAR, Ilocos Norte and Aklan, although the one-week growth rates have slowed in both provinces. In the National Capital Region, or NCR, new cases per day have averaged at 3,000, while the intensive care unit, or ICU, occupancy is at 71%. The Department of Health recorded 14,249 new COVID cases on August 14, springing the number the total number to 1,727,231. A total of 1,598,314 recovered, while 30,070 died of COVID-19. The Department of Health, or DOH, said it has been transparent about how it spent the country's coronavirus pandemic response funds. In a lagging handa, Briefing on Saturday, Health Undersecretary Maria Rosario Vergere maintained that there is no corruption in the Philippine, in the 67.3 billion Philippine pesos of funds flagged by the Commission on Audit. Let's watch this. Uh, most of these were already, uh, nandyan na po lahat ng dokumento, it's prepared already. Ang mga questions lang would be, uh, particularly, meron pong mga hindi tayong units na mga DOH na hindi pa ho nakakapagkumpleto nito mga requirements ng document. So atin pong dinodobol uh, ang ating efforts para makuha na ho natin lahat ito and we are not going to wait for that specific timeline na binigay para makumpleto natin ang kailangan natin isumite so that this uh, report will be closed already. Yung mga kababayan na sana po ipaghusga, gawin natin kapag kompleto na ho lahat ng ating mga nakikitang mga ebidensya. Ang atin pong kagawaran ng kalusugan ay patuloy na nagbibigay ng uh, at most na trabaho para po sa ating mga kababayan. At pagdating po sa kaperahan, hindi hindi po kami gumagawa ng korupsyon. And COA has clarified this already yesterday na yung kanilang ginagawa ay procedural at hindi kailangang bahiran na may korupsyon agad ang aming kagawaran dahil nagsusumiti pa po tayo ng mga dokumento na kinakailangan for evidence that we have already utilized this fund. The state audit body in its 2020 annual audit report found deficiencies involving COVID-19 funds amounting to 67.3 billion pesos due to non-submission of documentations or supporting papers. However, in a clarification released on Friday, the COA said the report itself does not mention any findings by the auditors of, lost, of funds lost to corruption and the DOH may still submit uh, the required papers. It said, I quote, as there are recommendations for compliance by the DOH, the audit process for the deficiencies pointed has not been completed. Hence, it is premature at this stage to make conclusions on the findings in the consolidated annual audit report. Meanwhile, Manila Mayor Francisco Escomoreno Dumagoso was admitted to the Santa Ana Hospital on Sunday after he tested positive for COVID-19. Hospital Director 
Dr. Grace Padilla said Moreno or Mayor Isco Moreno has been diagnosed with a mild case of uh, COVID-19. She said he is maintained on oral antibiotics and vitamins as supplements, adding that he is now in stable condition. Moreno assured his constituents that the local government will continue its operations. Earlier, Vice Mayor Hani Lacuna also confirmed she tested positive for COVID-19. And Dr. Padilla said she is on her way to recovery. And ASEAN in Focus will be right back. Please stay tuned. Innovation. Digital disruption. Globalization. Startups, micro, small and medium enterprises, as well as large corporations, all face interesting challenges in the market today. Peek into the world of exciting opportunities and partnerships to drive growth with the latest business news and information. We are open for business. Your weekly dose of entrepreneurial inspiration to update you on the latest developments in the world of business. Get up close and personal with CEOs and thought leaders to help you discover valuable insights Sharpen your instincts for smart decision-making with the latest markets and economic trends. Disruptive ideas, global innovation, social entrepreneurship, and other leading-edge business ideas. Join the conversations to create a more vibrant environment for entrepreneurship. Catch Open for Business from Vision to Action. Factual. We have to defeat the virus everywhere. Timely information. Balanced. Not only in the country, but also abroad. I'm certain of one thing. Interviews that people need to know. Watch Aguila Pilipinas. A one-hour newscast of reports coming from regional hubs in Luzon, Visayas, and Mindanao. Know the important updates in Asia in ASEAN in Focus. Track the latest stories in the provinces in Aguila, Provincia. Tune into Mata ng Aguila, the evening primetime news program of Net25. Balanced and objective. Matanang Aguila covers national and international issues, tackles news on business, health, science and technology, entertainment, sports and human interest features, and current events. And Eagle News International delivers the latest global reports, impartial, accessible, and up-to-date. It brings to four EBC's rich international scope and access to valuable information streams. Catch these programs on Net25. You can also watch our news programs through eaglenews.ph and Eagle News Facebook page and YouTube channel. Welcome back to ASEAN in Focus. Police warned against the hoarding of medical equipment and supplies, such as oxygen tanks, used in treating patients, and urged the public to report such incidents. Amid the rising number of coronavirus cases, Philippine National Police Chief General Guillermo Elizar said the police will continue to be on the lookout for persons who hoard medical equipment at this time of health crisis. In a statement, he said the PNP will continue to be vigilant to prevent hoarding of oxygen tanks and other medical equipment and supplies. Elizar called on the public to report information 
on hoarding of medical equipment and supplies by some unscrupulous individuals. Earlier, Health Secretary Francisco Duque said there is currently no shortage on the supply of medical-grade oxygen, but urged the public not to hoard oxygen tanks at home so that the supply could circulate and avert a shortage. Barangay Pasong Tamo, senior citizens in Quezon City got their long-awaited first shot of COVID-19 vaccine on Sunday. 420 received the American-made Moderna jab at Pasong Tamo Elementary School. And some even arrived at the campus as early as 5 a.m. or three hours ahead of the start of the vaccination. The line was orderly and no problems were reported. After filling up information sheets, the elderly had their blood pressure taken. Their second dose will be on September 12. Public school buildings are being used as vaccination by sites as face-to-face -face classes are still prohibited. Over 15 million individuals nationwide have received at least the first dose of the vaccine as of August 11. In Quezon City, 1,963,922 doses have been administered as of August 15. Of the total, 670,929 are second doses or 41.76 of the city's 1.7 million target population. The city is still dealing with 6,972 active COVID cases also as of Sunday. Authorities have detected 182 additional cases of the more transmissible Delta variant of the coronavirus, raising the total to 807, the Department of Health DOH reported on Sunday. The Lambda variant case is a 35-year-old female, but it is still unknown if it is a local or returning overseas Filipino case. Um, Secretary, unang naiulat po ang Lambda sa Peru tulad po nung nasabi kanina sa news report noong, noong 2020 po. Ang Peru ay isa sa may kamataas na bilang ng mga namatay sa COVID bawat kapita. Sa ngayon, sa bawat isang libo ng populasyon, 596 po ang namamatay sa COVID. Umabot po sa siyam na po at 7% o 97% percent ang variant na lambda na naalala po sa Lima ang capital po ng lungsod ng po. Mabilis na kumakalat ito ngayon nga sa South America tulin po ng Chile, Argentina, Ecuador at siya po ay namasyal na sa daigdig pati na dito sa Pilipinas no meron na kayong isang kaso ayon sa kabakailang ulat po ng World Health Organization natagpuan na po ito sa halos dalampot siyam na mga bansa uh, all over the world. Tayong uh, uh, datos na ganun kung gano'n siya kabilis o kapanghawa. In fact po, um, ang sinasabi po ng mga scientific o, uh, or mga scientists, uh, ang hindi pang karinimuan pasama po ng mga mutations ng lambda variant ang nagiging dahilan kung bakit mas madali siya makapanghawa. Tulad din po ng mga ibang variants, ang uh, mutation po ng lambda ay nasa spike protein kung bahagi ng virus na ginagamit pang kapit sa mga selula na sasalakayin ito. No? Um, ano pa po, uh, sa ngayon po ay tinitingnan pa po nila kung ito po ba katulad din ng Delta na nakakapanghawa nga po ng hanggang walong tao. Uh, hindi pa po siya, uulin lang po natin na hindi pa po siya variant of concern. Siya ay diniklara pa lang noong Hunyo ng WHO na variant of interest. Yung po ang kanyang uh, ano ngayon, uh, klasifikasyon na meron po siya mga mutations sa uh, sa spike protein na no na maari po mas madali siya makapanghawa dahil po mas madali siyang kumapit sa selula ng mga panahong kanyang uh, aatakihin no at meron din po pinapakita siyang karakteristik na maaring ang mga antibodies as mahirap na i-neutralize ang virus. Subalit, uh, ito ay kailangan pa po ng uh, patuloy na pag-aaral, uh, uh, Secretary. Um, ayon po sa ulat ng, uh, ng Department of Health, ito po ay uh, isang local case 
hindi po siya returning hindi po returning Filipino uh, overseas Filipino uh, siya po ay uh, katulad din na naiulat nyo kanina sa uh, bago tayo nagsimula ng interview uh, isa po siyang uh, 35 years old na female na wala pa, pa na wala pa symptoms at cover na po siya after a uh, 10-day isolation period po. Uh, sa ngayon po, ang Department of Health ay gumagawa pa po ng back tracing at case investigation. Masagot po yung in, ang mga katun, katanungan ng ating mga kababayan ukol sa kasong ito. Meanwhile, U.S. regulators has authorized a uh, third dose of COVID vaccines by Pfizer, BioNTech, and Moderna for people with compromised immune systems who are likely to have weaker protection from the two-dose regimens. Here's Dr. Nina Gloriani, head of the Philippine Vaccine Expert Panel, to talk about a little bit about the Lambda and about the booster shot. Take a look. Hindi, hindi. Ang eh, kukunti pa lang ng information sa efficacy against the Lambda variant. Pero mayroong isang study sa Chile kasi alam nyo, itong Lambda variant, mas mamay doon sa Latin America, no? Uh, sino? Peru, nag-umpis yan, uh, uh, Argentina, Chile, and then uh, Ecuador. So, sa Chile, mayroong silang pag-aaral na bumaba by threefold yung uh, neutralizing antibodies against the lambda variant. So, hindi naman masyadong mabahan na yung threefold. Actually, doon sa iba kong mga variants, like yung uh, variant of concern ng Delta, nasa yung iba sixfold ang baba. Oh. Pero still, hindi pa naman siya enough yung evidence na nakaka, nakaka mas masama yung nagiging epekto ng variant na ito, clinically, and sa pagbabuna. Uh, versus uh, mga ibang um, Bias, pero yung mga bakuna ay nakaka-protect pa rin lahat dito sa mga variants na to against the severe form of COVID due to the variants. So, may ganong data pero may protection. You know? Nasa ano naman natin, nasa discussion niya sa all experts group kung sino ang bibigyan, sino ang, how do we define sino ang immunocompromised? Of course, number one, mga elderly immunocompromised yan. Pero sino? Yung mga nare, may transplant, yung transplant patients, yung nag, nag-inom ng mga immunosuppressive, anti-metabolite drugs, yung mga may HIV, yung pong mga cancer patients na nagkikimo. So yan po yung mga tibiyan natin, pero nakasalalay pa rin nga po sa supply ng vaccine ang ating magiging uh, rekomendasyon. Actually, mayroon naman pong napag-usapan na, na ta talagang ibibigay pero subject to availability nitong mga bakuna na ito. Kasi uunahin pa rin po natin na makabuo ng population protection or yung herd immunity that we need. Kasi hindi po mangyayari yung kailangan protection, yung gusto na protection kung kukonte ang ating nababakunahan which uh, is think now at only about 12% or less than 15%. Kailangan po natin sa ano at least 50 percent, although we aim for higher, 70, 80 percent. Stay tuned for more news. Alma and I will be back after these short messages. Mapupuno ng saya, impormasyon at inspirasyon ang hapon mo sa Afternoon Power. Handog sa inyo ng Net25. Sasabay sa inyong tangalian ang inyong Happy Time Barkada at 12 noon. Alamin ang mga pangyayari sa ASEAN Nations, ASEAN in Focus at 2 p.m. Ang inyong paboritong awit komentaryo kasama si Leo Obligar sa Piskante ng Bayan. At mga balita sa iba't ibang panig ng bansa, hatid sa atin sa Agila, Provincia. Siksik ang hapon mo mula lunes hanggang biyernes ang inyong Afternoon Power sa Net25. Kumanta, sumaya tayong lahat.
Iba't ibang sakuna at kalabidad ang nararanasan ng bansa. Kapag may banta ng panganib, kailangang maging alerto at kung kailangang lumikas ay magtungo sa ligtas na lugar. Bilang paghahanda sa mga ganitong pagkakataon, mahalaga na may gobag na dadalhin ang pamilya. Narito ang dapat na nilalaman ng gobag na isang pamilyang handa. Mahalagang dokumento sa selyadong lalagyan, flashlight, kandila, posporo at silbato, radyo na may bago at ekstrang baterya. First aid kit kasama ang panduna sa lagnat, LBM, sugat at iba pa. Ang mga gamot na regular na iniinom ng pamilya. Magagamit para sa mga sanggol, bata, matatanda at may kapansanan, pera at mga bariya. Pagkain na madaling ihanda, di na kailangang lutuin at sapat para sa tatlong araw. Inuming tubig sa saradong lalagyan at sapat para sa tatlong araw. Telepono, power bank at charger. Lubid, lumang dyaryo, matitibay na lalagyan. Damit, kapote, bota at mga sanitary supplies. Sleeping bag o banig at mga kumot. Suriin ang mga laman ng gobag kada tatlong buwan. At palitan ang mga laman nito na malapit ng masira. Ilagay ang gobag sa lugar na madali itong makita at makuha sa oras ng sakuna. Impormasyong mahalaga sa taong bayan. Patas na pagbabalita. Papakinggan ang magkabilang panig. Lilinawin ang mga isyu at kaagad na ihahatid ng objektibo. Mata ng Agila. Tumadagit ng pinakasariwang pangyayari, hindi lamang sa loob ng bansa, kundi sa iba't ibang panig ng daigdig. Mula sa Eagle News Teams at sa tulong ng makabagong teknolohiya, tiyak na makakalap kaagad ang katotohanan. Para sa mas matalas, malinaw at malalimang pagbabalita, ito ang mas pinatalas na mata ng Agila. Inihahati ng veteranong broadcast journalist na si Eli Saludar. Kasama si Binibining Pilipinas Intercontinental 2019, Emma Tiglao. At pinangungunahan ng batikang mamamahayag ng bansa, Vic De Leon Lima. Mata ng Agila, lunes hanggang biyernes, alas 6 hanggang alas 8 ng gabi, dito sa Net25. Welcome back to ASEAN in Focus. Meanwhile, Malaysia's Central Bank slash its economic growth forecast for this year on Friday after authorities imposed a new lockdown to fight a coronavirus surge driven by the highly contagious Delta variant. Citing the re-imposition of curbs, the central bank slashed its full-year growth forecast to between 3.0 to 4.0 percent, down from 6.0 to 7.5 percent previously. However, Bank Negara added it expected a gradual recovery in the fourth quarter this year with higher global growth and sustained policy support providing a further lift to economic growth. Like other parts of Southeast Asia, the country is battling its worst COVID-19 wave yet, reporting tens of thousands of cases and hundreds of deaths a day. The new lockdown imposed in June has forced the closure of most businesses and dealt a heavy blow to an already teetering economy, but has so far had little success in blunting the virus surge. Staying in Malaysia, the country will open up more sectors to individuals who have been fully vaccinated in an effort to rebuild parts of the economy which have been shot due to the virus outbreak. That is according to Prime Minister Muyihideen Yassin on Sunday. Under the new guidelines which will take effect today, hair salons, shops selling electric goods, furniture, sporting equipment and car accessories will be allowed to operate in states under the first phase 
of the National Recovery Plan, according to the Prime Minister in a statement. Stores offering used clothing, antiques and toys can resume business under the second phase. The government placed the entire country under lockdown in June in a move that cost 40,000 people their jobs, with the hit estimated at 1.1 billion ringgit. The curbs will not be lifted in states such as the capital Kuala Lumpur, which is recording thousands of new infections every day, and the commercial heartland of Selangor. But the government also announced easing restrictions for double jabbed residents regardless of their state, such as home quarantine for 14 days upon return to the country and an allowance for married couples to cross state lines to meet their spouses. In another news, the Banco Central ng Pilipinas or BSP stands ready to deploy appropriate monetary policy tools necessary to safeguard price and financial stability goals. Here's Banco Central ng Pilipinas, Governor Benjamin Jocno. BSP remains, will remain vigilant against any emerging risk to the outlook for inflation growth. BSP stands ready to adjust its policy settings as needed to ensure price and financial stability conducive to a sustainable economic recovery. Dokno said he believes the current uptick in global commodity prices is transitory given the, the revi revival of demand as economies recover from the pandemic. He said that while fluctuations in global commodity prices impact on domestic inflation rate, the central bank is closely monitoring and assessing this to prevent any signs of second round effects from supply side inflation. Meanwhile, Asian stocks were mixed on Monday morning as the resurgence of the Delta variant continued to weigh on economies globally, including in China, where new data showed activity showed more than expected in July. Retail sales expanded 8.5% in July year on year, and industrial output was up 6.4% according to figures released by Beijing Statistics Bureau, with both figures below analyst estimates, lockdowns and other movement restrictions brought in to combat the country's recent coronavirus outbreaks have been blamed for hampering economic performance as well as of a series of deadly floods. Raymond Yung, chief economist for Greater China at ANZ Banking Group, said the figures, the biggest or the figures suggest the economy is losing steam very fast. Surging infections linked to the Delta variant of the coronavirus also adds extra risk to August activities, he added. Meanwhile, Iris Pang, ING's chief economist for Greater China, told AFP industrial output was weak because of the semiconductor chip shortage that has affected production. There were dips in Hong Kong, Sydney, Singapore, Taipei, and Jakarta, while Shanghai, Wellington, and Manila were up. The challenges brought about by geopolitical realities and COVID-19 pandemic, senior officials are positive that EU-ASEAN relations are bound to expand and flourish in the coming years. And welcoming the, the Philippines, Philippines assuming the ASEAN role of EU-ASEAN dialogue ASEAN coordinator, the EU delegation to the Philippines held on 12th August a webinar on what does the strategic partnership mean for EU-ASEAN relations. The webinar provided a platform for diplomats to discuss how the two regional blocs can continue to ensure peace, prosperity, sustainability, and connectedness among their peoples and other stakeholders. The webinar also commemorated ASEAN Day and aligned with the Philippines' adopted theme of building the future better. EU Ambassador to the Philippines, Lok Verven, said that the EU-ASEAN strategic partnership should be an occasion to strengthen our cooperation in addressing global issues such as global warming, combating and recovering from COVID-19, peace and security, human rights and sustainable development. 
the EU ambassador to ASEAN, Igor Dreismans, emphasized that the EU is committed to work closely together with the Philippines in advocating for a green partnership, enhancing security and military ties, and promoting connectivity in the region. Philippines Foreign Affairs Under Secretary for Bilateral Relations and ASEAN Affairs Maria Teresa P. Lazaro commented that, I quote, ASEAN EU will continue to champion the respect for international law including the 1982 UNCLOS or UNCLOS, ASEAN and EU should continue to reaffirm the importance of maintaining peace, security, safety and the right of freedom of navigation and overflight of the South China Sea as well as the peaceful resolution of disputes in accordance with international law particularly the 1982 UNCLOS or UNCLOS. And welcoming the Philippines as the ASEAN coordinator for ASEAN-EU dialogue relations. The recent meeting of EU High Representative and Vice President Josep Borrell with Foreign Secretary Loxin on uh, 28 June 2021 was a reaffirmation of the importance of deepening the EU-ASEAN relations and the readiness for engagement in areas of mutual interest, including security cooperation. This is today's topic and how we can work together with the Philippines in the coming three years to deepen our partnership. With the EU strategy for cooperation in the Indo-Pacific, we have underlined our interest to intensify our work to boost trade and investment, economic openness, and a sustainable approach to connectivity in the region. At the same time, we are determined to deepen our security engagement in and with Asia, for example, on maritime security and conflict prevention. So from humble beginnings in 1977, ASEAN and EU perhaps is the most successful example of regionalism in the world, are now strategic partners and key stakeholders in the rapidly evolving regional security architecture. The EU remains a very important trading partner of ASEAN. According to statistics, the EU is the second largest foreign investor in ASEAN and is ASEAN's third largest trading partner. In 2020, the, EU, the EU's investment totaled 7.6 billion US dollars and total two-way trade stood at over 258 billion US dollars. This for ASEAN and the EU to strengthen both regions' preparedness for and capacity to respond effectively to current and future public health emergencies, including the fostering of innovation, research and development in science and technology, and allow to keep up for ASEAN to keep up with the fourth industrial revolution while preparing for post-pandemic recovery. ASEAN and EU strongly support vaccine multilateralism and the World Health Organization as the international community work together to ensure fair, equitable and affordable access to safe and effective vaccines as global public goods. As such, we appreciate the EU's Team Europe package of over um, 800 million euro to combat the spread of the disease and mitigate its impact on the region. Next, as promoters of the importance of rules-based multilateral order, ASEAN EU will continue to champion the respect for international law, including the 1982 UNCLOS. ASEAN and EU should continue to reaffirm the importance of maintaining and promoting peace, security, safety, and the right to freedom and navigation in and over flight above the South China Sea, as well as the peaceful resolution of disputes in accordance with international law, particularly the 1982 Hong Kong. So when looking forward and as we embark on this new adventure with uh, the Philippines as country coordinator, allow me to be a bit ambitious and formulate uh, three priorities or, or wishes for the coming years. Uh, uh, priorities which largely coincide with the priorities under Secretary uh, has mentioned. Our first ambition is for the EU and ASEAN to conclude a stronger green partnership. 
uh, the IPCC report, which was released a few days back, is absolutely terrifying and should be a wake-up call for all of us. And we, EU and ASEAN, have a keen interest to uh, work together. We realize that due to rapid growth and in the absence of any significant decarbonization, energy-related greenhouse gas emissions in the, e e in the ASEAN region uh, might almost double by 2040. We also realize the importance of ASEAN's biodiversity and the need to protect it. We have several cooperation programs uh, ongoing, including with the ASEAN Center for Biodiversity in the Philippines. But we need to up our ambition. Uh, concretely, we think it's time for us to intensify and widen our cooperation on issues such as circular economy, clean oceans and sustainable food systems, to launch a clean energy dialogue, to upgrade our climate and environment dialogue to a ministerial level. Thank you, Gila, for keeping me company today here on ASEAN in Focus. You're very much welcome, Alma, and likewise. And that is the latest news in the Southeast Asian nations. Stay updated about the ASEAN region. I'm Gila Pablo, your ABC Thailand correspondent, and we live in interesting times. We'll see you back tomorrow. I'm Alma Angeles, and we live in interesting times.